Hi everyone, great to be here today speaking with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Chris and I are going to be talking about collecting sexual orientation and gender identity or SOGI data in electronic health records. I'll start with an overview of some of the concepts and terminology and best practices from a care team standpoint, and then Chris is going to focus much more on the technical nitty gritty of how to do this with an electronic health record and how to set up quality improvement processes within the health system. There are a lot of terms that get used when we first start focusing on care for sexual and gender minority people that can be overwhelming and confusing. So let's talk through this a bit step by step to make sure we're all on the same page. The first big point to make is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. These are two different experiences, two different concepts. Everyone has both a sexual orientation and a gender identity. Each of us has one of each. The terms and concepts we've used throughout history have evolved. So terms and concepts we had 20 years ago are different than the ones we had 10 years ago, five years ago, even a year ago. I'm hearing new terms from my sexual and gender minority, particularly younger patients in the last four to six months that I hadn't heard even a year prior. Part of this is a really fascinating and rapidly moving linguistic revolution. Terminology will also vary over time for a given person. You can imagine someone may initially identify as straight and later identify as gay. Someone may initially identify as a woman and later identify as a man, for example. What is gender identity? It's a person's inner sense of being a girl, woman, boy, man, something else in terms of gender or having no gender at all. In most countries and cultures around the world, babies are born and assigned one of two sexes based on external anatomy female or male, in some cases, intersex. We now know these babies grow up, become children, adolescents, and adults who may have a gender identity, an inner sense of their gender that doesn't align in a conventional way with the sex they were assigned when they were born. We also appreciate that many people have a gender identity that doesn't fit one of the two traditional binary options of either girl or boy, woman or man. So we acknowledge that people have non-binary gender identities. Gender expression is how a person communicates or presents their gender to the outside world. This can be through mannerisms, the way someone walks, their voice, their hairstyle, the way they dress. And this also doesn't just fit neatly into two categories. It's not the case that people assign female sex at birth want to or necessarily ought to uh, behave in a traditionally feminine way, whatever that means, or that people assign male sex at birth would necessarily want to or ought to uh, behave in a traditionally male sex, uh, masculine way, whatever that means. Each of us has ways in which we express our gender that's traditionally feminine and traditionally masculine. It's also contextual. Someone may be more feminine at work and more masculine at home, whatever that means, again. And there's a cultural component. What's considered masculine or feminine in one culture isn't necessarily the same in another. What does this term transgender mean? It's an umbrella term for someone whose gender identity doesn't align in a traditional way with the sex they were assigned when they were born. Someone assigned male sex at birth who identifies as a woman may refer themselves as a transgender woman, a trans woman, simply as a woman. Say, I was a girl when I was a kid, I'm a woman as an adult, I'm no different than any other woman, we hear that too. And sometimes we see terms in the biomedical literature like male to female or MTS. People with non-binary gender identities may have a variety of ways of identifying. The most common term I hear, particularly from my younger non-binary patients, is gender queer. We also hear the term gender fluid, which refers to a gender identity that is dynamic and may evolve over time. The terms transmasculine and transfeminine are more inclusive of people with non-binary identities. So a transmasculine person is someone assigned female sex at birth who identifies more with masculinity than femininity and may or may not identify in a binary way as a man. That's gender identity. Sexual orientation, in contrast, is how a person identifies their physical, emotional, and romantic attractions to other people. This We think of in three components. There's desire, whom someone is attracted to. When I was in med school, I was trained to ask, are you attracted to men, women, or both? Now we say, um, who are you attracted to, or what are the genders of the people you're attracted to, to acknowledge that there are more than two possible genders. 
Behavior refers to whom someone is engaging in sexual activity with and what kind of sexual activity. So we use these very concrete operationalized behavioral terms like women who have sex with women, women who have sex with women and men, men who have sex with men, men who have sex with men and women, et cetera. And identity refers to the range of labels and communities that exist in society that someone may or may not identify with regarding their sexual orientation, like straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and queer, for example. With all these terms for gender identity and sexual orientation, we can't make assumptions based on how someone looks or how they sound about how they identify, or assumptions based on their behavior. Um, for example, there are many men who have sex with men who don't identify as gay, bisexual, or queer, identify as straight. So in healthcare, we have to ask people how they self-identify, and that's what we document, and that's what we go based on in healthcare. Clinical care, research, and policy work with LGBTQ people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people, increasingly is uh, something we inform with the minority stress framework. The idea is that LGBTQ people experience everyday discrimination, victimization, microaggressions, frank violence at a much higher prevalence than the general population. We think of all of that as external stigma-related stress which for many people over time can lead to disruptions in certain general psychological processes like interpersonal functioning, coping skills, emotional regulation, cognitive structures that aren't adaptive, like believing it's never gonna get better, nobody can be trusted, no one will ever love me. And all that external stigma-related stress can cause internal stigma-related stress, internalized homophobia or transphobia, believing all the negative things society says about your identity, expecting rejection and identity concealment because you're so afraid of being mistreated. All that we think is related to what we see in the research, which is a higher prevalence of behavioral health problems among LGBTQ people, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use disorder, decreased self-care, decreased engagement in primary care and healthcare, and down the road a much higher prevalence of various physical health problems as well. LGBTQ youth, these are some of the health disparities faced by the population. Youth are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide than other youth, more likely to be homeless, more likely to uh, become infected with HIV or other sexually transmitted infections. Incidence of HIV remains high and stable among black men who have sex with men and is rapidly increasing among gay and bisexual Latino men. Transgender folks report very high prevalence of negative experiences in healthcare, like being verbally harassed or refused treatment because of their gender identity, not seeking needed healthcare, urgent and preventative care due to fear of being mistreated related to their gender identity, and not going to a healthcare provider when they needed to because they couldn't afford it in the context of a lot of housing and employment discrimination. Older LGBTQ adults also report a lot of heartbreaking stories about being um, mistreated in assisted living facilities and other services for older adults. You think that these would be folks who can hopefully come out of the closet and live peacefully in their golden years and it turns out that's often not the case. So how do we overcome all these barriers? The first big point is to end invisibility of LGBTQ people in healthcare. We need to know who our LGBTQ patients are. This is a strong recommendation by the Institute of Medicine and Healthy People 2020. Um, so that we can provide patient-centered, tailored, customized care based on someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. But we don't know, based on how someone looks or sounds, what their sexual orientation or gender identity are. So we have to have this as part of our systematic uh, questions that we ask all patients in a sensitive, affirming way. Clinicians often fail to ask these questions. Whenever I'm, I'm in a room training clinicians, I ask, um, you know, people, if they tend to ask this question, and I've never had half the room say that they do. So we need to rely on frontline staff, registration, and so on to be the first line collecting these data. This is an example of why it matters. Rodrigo is a 40-year-old trans man who developed pelvic pain and spotting. It biopsy determined Rodrigo had cervical cancer. He got care at a health center that was not asking about gender identity in a sensitive, effective way, so he didn't feel comfortable disclosing his transgender status, and the cervical cancer, unfortunately, wasn't caught until it was too late, even though he has a mother and sister with a history of uh, cervical cancer as well. So everyone in the healthcare system needs to be involved in this process. Clinicians need to understand the health considerations related to sexual orientation and gender identity and how to have 
conversations with patients and their families about this. Front desk staff, registration staff need to know how to engage in sensitive, effective communication, how to field concerns when patients have questions about why we're requesting this information from them, and how to document it all in the electronic health record. And patients need to understand why we're asking these questions, that it's directly relevant to their health care, that we're asking all our patients these questions to provide affirming care so we're not profiling this one patient, and that we're only going to use the information in a sensitive, effective way. Studies show that while most clinicians and health care staff think that patients will either refuse to provide this information or be offended when they're asked for this information, studies show almost all patients are fine, uh, are happy to disclose this information, their sex orientation and their gender identity, and are not offended by these questions. So it's a lot of anticipatory anxiety on the part of staff. We don't feel confident and competent asking these questions. So we project it onto the patients when in fact they would be fine with it if we ask it in a sensitive, effective way. Some staff will need extra coaching, extra reassurance. We're not doing this to try to change anybody's political beliefs, their values, their religious beliefs. It's really to provide inclusive, affirming, high quality care to everybody who comes through our doors. So if we appeal to the staff sense of professional idealism, that goes a long way. Staff are also your eyes and ears. Regular check-ins will help you find out what's working, what's not working, if a form needs to be changed, so you can engage in iterative quality improvement, as Chris will discuss. This is one of the toolkits on our website at lgbthealtheducation.org, the National LGBT Health Education Center. This is a toolkit approved by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, Ready, Set, Go for collecting SOGI data. And we also have various demonstration videos on our website, LG, again, lgbthealtheducation.org, showing folks in bite-sized two to three minute videos how to ask these questions at the front desk, how to respond when a patient has concerns, what the clinician can do when a parent comes in with a gender diverse child, and so on, different settings. These are, again, on our website in English and in Spanish, very clear instructions for how staff can ask these SOGI questions. And these are pamphlets on our website for uh, patients. These can be in the waiting room at the front desk, explaining to patients why we're asking these questions, that we're asking everyone to provide affirming care, that the information we'll use respectfully and confidentially in a way that's directly relevant to their care. We have these on the website in English, Spanish, Simplified Chinese. We just also added them in Arabic, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese, and we're doing other translations as well. So there are different points at which you could ask these questions. It could be through the patient portal, privacy and comfort of the patient's home. If they have questions about why they're being asked for this information, they may not be able to ask anybody at home, though. If we ask it at registration at the front desk, then you need to set up with some privacy. Front desk staff need to be trained to field concerns. Um, we also need to um, make sure that we don't get into a big back and forth at the front desk if someone has concerns. So the the front desk staff can refer it to the clinician to discuss further with the client. And this normalizes questions along with other demographic questions about race, ethnicity, income, and so on. Clinicians often fail to ask these questions. They think they know how to take shortcuts with the focused history, so that it's not really reliable to have the clinicians be the first line asking this. We've been part of practice transformation initiatives where it appears the best place to ask these questions is at registration. Chris will talk more about how we ask these questions as a two-step process. Also important to ask what name someone goes by, what names on their insurance, because those can be different, and what are your pronouns? We used to say, what pronouns do you prefer? Preference implies the pronouns are optional, other people can ignore them, which isn't the case. So the best practice is to say, what are your pronouns? These are different pronouns folks use. Uh, really important for providing inclusive affirming care for trans and non-binary people. Some pronouns we're more familiar with, like he, him, his, or she, her, hers. Many people's pronouns now are they, them, theirs, in the singular. This takes practice. You'll make mistakes initially. That's okay. You just say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, and keep going. Pronouns Z, he, or hers are ones that are developed for folks with non-binary identities. Again, this takes practice. Um, you're not necessarily going to know every set of pronouns patients may have before you hear them. So it's more about having a process of saying, you know, am I pronouncing it correctly? Can you show me how to spell them? I'll make sure they're in the electronic health record. I'll tell our other staff, please let us know if we make any mistakes. So it's cultural humility and following the patient's lead. 
they leave the SOGI questions blank at registration. That's fine. It's totally voluntary. They're not required to provide it. Then the clinician can follow up and say, we've begun asking patients about their sex orientation and gender identity, so we can provide affirmative care for all clients. I see you left these questions blank at registration. I was wondering if you had questions, whether we might talk about how you think about yourself in this regard, for example. For youth, we recommend asking about gender identity as you know, young as three years old, gender identity is solidified. It's often very clear. Parents may come in with a young child with questions about their gender expression, in which case the recommendation is follow the child's lead. You know, we don't do any medical interventions before puberty. And uh, sexual orientation, we recommended asking at 13 years old when we start having sexual health conversations with, with kids, uh, with uh, adolescents, I should say. That say sometimes, that said, there are eight-year-olds who may come in and say, you know, I'm gay, and then you have a sexual orientation that you could document potentially. You want to ensure that you're having separate time with the minor to ask them these questions, because if the forms are being filled out at the front desk, the parents may have filled them out, and there may be a bias in the responses uh, that way. LGBTQ people have a history of stigma, discrimination in healthcare. Don't be surprised if you make a mistake, the patient becomes upset. Don't personalize the reaction, just apologize. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, and then correct yourself. That can help diffuse a difficult situation, reestablish constructive dialogue with the patient. And you want to not have gender-related assumptions in the language you use. So we want to think about it, be more mindful, and not use these gender assumptions. So instead of saying, how may I help you, sir, when you don't know someone's gender identity, you could say, how may I help you? Instead of saying he's here for his appointment, you could say the patient's here in the waiting room. Instead of asking something like, do you have a wife? You could ask, are you in a relationship? Instead of asking, what are your mother's and father's names? You can just ask, you know, what are your guardian's names? Who are the grown-ups at home? Something along those lines. You want to stay away from slurs, disrespectful language, gossiping about a patient's appearance or behavior is never acceptable, saying things that we think are going to establish good rapport but are actually off topic and can be insulting to patients, like saying, you look great, you look like a real woman, real man. Then we want to avoid certain really outdated terms like homosexual imposed on the you know, uh, sexual minority community by the medical field. So instead, we want to use the language the patient themselves uses, like gay, lesbian, bisexual, or queer. We don't use the term transvestite, which is a term for a non-transgender person who wears clothing traditionally designed for another gender. We don't use the term transgendered ED at the end. That makes it sound like there was an event that made the person transgender. So instead, we use the term transgender ER at the end, and always an adjective, never a noun. So we say person of transgender experience or transgender person, for example. And instead of sexual preference or lifestyle choice, we say sexual orientation. If you don't know name, the patient's name and pronouns, you can just ask, um, I would like to be respectful. What are your name and pronouns? The name they give you doesn't match their insurance. Just ask, could your charter insurance be under a different name? They know it doesn't match. So you ask it in a non-judgmental, supportive, helpful way that is very beneficial. Finally, good to review forms and policies in a healthcare system to ensure that it's language that's inclusive of LGBTQ people. This is another tool on our website, lgbthealtheducation.org, for reviewing forms and policies. So you can see terms to avoid and then how these can be replaced with more inclusive terminology in the right column. This is a gender inclusive diagram on a form that you could have in a practice so that people with gender diverse bodies can still mark their symptoms on the body. And this can be helpful in an OBGYN practice, for example, with transmasculine patients. Adding affirmative imagery and content goes a long way in your marketing materials and your posters and your pamphlets. And training all staff, this is a tool we have on implicit bias training with case scenarios, is critically important for clinical and non-clinical staff, concepts, terminology, health disparities, implicit bias, effective communication, SOGI data collection, of course, and confidentiality and privacy. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris Grosso. Great, thanks, Alex. <clears throat> can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Great, great. thanks, Alex. Um, so um, initially, I think um, um, I'm just gonna jump in and sort of share some data um, that um, Alex and I and a couple of our colleagues 
uh, analyzed and actually um, just recently found out got accepted and will be uh, in the July edition of the American Journal of Public Health. And so back in 2016, um, the Bureau of Primary Health Care required all um, fairly, qualified, fairly qualified health centers uh, to begin collecting and reporting sexual orientation gender identity data. And so what you're looking at here um, is a result of the first year of data collection. Um, and, you know, the couple of things to kind of note here is that um, one of the things that we often hear is that people are concerned that rural health centers aren't going to um, be able to collect these data from their patients. Um, and that's not actually what we saw um, in the first year of this data collection. We actually saw that they did slightly better uh, than health centers that were located in an urban environment. Um, and similarly, we saw also heard concerns uh, that small health centers um, would also have a challenge too because of maybe potential anonymity as well. Um, but this isn't necessarily what we saw within the results. Um, the other thing that, that was really kind of interesting around this too is that there were the first year that they rolled out these data, there were sort of, I would say, a number of barriers in place. One is that they didn't, person didn't make the announcement until the second quarter of 2016, many EHR vendors didn't have places to record these data. Um, but in spite of that, 75% of health centers, so there's about 1,400 health centers around the country, and 75% of them reported some data. So um, I, I thought that that was just really reoccur re reassuring and, and very encouraging. Um, and similarly, um, we also he often hear concerns that people also won't want to share gender identity data, or we hear that maybe LGBTQ people only live in big cities. and um, what you're basically seeing here is that that's not the case, right? So we are, again, we're saying that uh, actually uh, rural health, health centers, again, did a better job of collecting and reporting um, gender identity data than their urban health centers. Um, and similarly, um, we saw that, again, smaller health centers did a better job as well. I mean, there could be a number of reasons for this. And sometimes when you roll things out in a smaller environment, uh, maybe people only have one or two locations, these things are a little bit easier. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it, it's just very promising. Um, we did recently look at our 2017 data, um, and interestingly, we actually saw a, a drop in the number of missingness. So again, people are getting better and better at this. Um, we're also seeing our numbers go up in terms of uh, people who are identifying as um, LGB or, or something else as well. Um, we saw a similar trend in the gender identity data for 2017 too. Uh, where the number of missing uh, dropped off and the number of um, people who reported uh, being uh, transgender and non-binary non also increased as well. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we also looked at the, the uh, number of health centers who uh, provided data for 2017, uh, and that number increased. So there were only 4% of health centers um, who didn't report any sexual orientation data in 2017, right? So that's about 20% improvement. Um, same thing with gender identity, only about 4% of health, health centers didn't report any gender identity data. Um, and we looked at the health centers who didn't report either any gender identity data or any sex, sex orientation data. There was only 35 health centers. So uh, not, you know, 35%, but 35 health centers. So um, it's really, really pretty impressive in terms of the work that people are doing. Uh, we know that the data is not perfect. Hello? Real, real quick, can you share your um, screen, the slides? Oh, are they not, they not, um, sorry, I thought, I thought I shared the... Uh, sorry, I had left mine on. I realized we hadn't actually switched to yours, so... There we go. Okay. Oh, there Thank you go. You. Okay, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll jump back quickly just so you could see them. Uh, so this is the slide I was talking about where uh, the sexual orientation data um, uh, was very similar uh, in terms of reporting at... Um, uh, health centers that were rural versus urban and small versus large. Um, and similarly with the uh, gender um, identity data for 2016, where the rural health centers and small health centers actually did a better job of reporting these data. Um, this is the data I was just talking about in 2017, where we saw a drop off in terms of the missingness um, and an increase in terms of reporting in the um, LGB and something else categories. Um, and as I was mentioning before, um, when we looked at the data for 2017, um, there were only 35 health centers. So out of four, about 1,400 health centers around the country, only 35 didn't report any sex orientation or gender identity data. So, um, so I think that's really pretty fabulous. And I think, uh, you know, as I was saying, there's, you know, we have room to grow. It's not perfect, the data. We still have, you know, work on completeness. But um, I, I sort of feel like it's really encouraging, especially in the, the climate that we're in now. 
So just kind of jumping into, you know, our experience of sort of how, what can you do at your organization to either begin collecting these data or um, make some improvements along the way. And I always like to start off with this because I think sometimes people think like they have to be an LGBTQ person uh, to do this or sort of lead the charge in the organization, and that's not really true. Uh, one of the examples I always like to say is that it's almost like saying a female provider can't take up a male, take care, good care of a male patient, and we know that's not true. So anybody could could provide good care. Anybody could be a champion. Um, it's really about taking the time to educate yourself, like you're doing on, on the webinar today. Um, so in terms of some of the things that you can do, um, uh, I always uh, encourage people to make sure that they're being very inclusive when they're thinking about having a team uh, that's either working on 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 um, beginning the collection process or improving the process. Um, you know, um, sometimes we focus a lot on our uh, doctors, but we don't think about MAs or nurses uh, or even our data people or our EHR analysts. And it's really important to have everybody as part of uh, the team. Um, and similarly, it's also important to, to train everybody because when your patients come in, they're not just going to be interacting um, with your nurse practitioner or your PA. They're going to be inactor, interacting with your front desk staff. Um, or if there's a billing um, issue, they're going to be interacting with your billing department. So uh, you really want to make sure that everybody is really getting getting the same same training. And so from a, a patient's perspective, uh, it really feels very, very seamless. And they don't feel like they are um, have a different experience when they're interacting with either clinical or non-clinical people. Um, um, I'll kind of go into this a little bit later, but um, you know, we always hear issues around um, privacy and confidentiality. And you know, what I basically always say to people is like, you want to treat this data just like you would treat any other protected information. Um, you really don't want to um, do anything differently with that. And then I'll jump in, I'll give you some examples of the EHR customization in a bit. Um, but a few things that um, I wanted to kind of point out to you, and this is kind of goes back to what Alex was talking about in terms of looking at your forms, whether they're paper or electronic, um, and, and making a more uh, culturally um, a welcoming environment. And um, I sort of like to step through our registration form just as a way to kind of talk through that. So at the very top, you, you'll see here um, is where we ask our legal name. Um, and so this is, the, I oftentimes refer to this as the insurance name because this is really the information that has to go out on the insurance claim. Um, similarly with the, the sex information, um, we also need that information that is uh, uh, identical to what the insurers have, otherwise you sort of risk having a claim get rejected. But below those sort of stars, you'll see there's some um, text there in, I, in italics. And then basically what we're saying to our patients is that we know this may not be the name you use, and we'll use whatever name you want, but we need this information for billing purposes. And that really kind of goes a long way with our patients um, and is very meaningful and so they understand why we're asking that. Um, you also notice up to the right hand side of um, the stars where we we ask uh, for patients' name used and pronouns, um, which are also very critical in, in providing good care. Um, and down here, sort of towards the middle, uh, again, this is kind of what Alex was talking about in terms of looking at your forms. Um, and what we decided to do is really move all those try to remove those references to mother and father, um, and just have uh, parent and guardian here. And you know what we've heard from our patients who are not, are not necessarily LGBTQ or even from an LGBTQ family is that they really appreciate this because you know they might have a, just a single mom or single dad, um, and they don't have to sort of go through that experience every time of trying to explain why they don't have a mother or why they don't have a father. And so um, these these sort of forms really um, and changes often um, time um, have a much bigger impact um, on your patient population. And similarly, we've even heard from patients who. Um, again, may not be transgender, uh, but don't maybe like the name um, that they were giving. Maybe they were named after the great grandfather, and they don't really have to have a bad association with that. So they use a, you know their middle name or some other name, and so they like being able to provide that information to us. And down here towards the bottom, you'll see this is where we get into our questions around sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and again, you'll see this is embedded within our demographic section, and it's really about normalizing. Uh, the data collection here. So just like you ask race, just like you ask ethnicity, just like you ask income, um, you know, you want to ask your sexual orientation and gender identity in that same place. Um, it's also, I think, asking at registration is a natural time where people come in and are updating their information. So when you go to check in at your visit, it's like, has your address changed, your phone number changed? It's also an opportunity for people to sort of update that information. 
we do encourage people to uh, ask uh, sexual orientation gender identity updates uh, annually. Um, as we know, you know, this can change over time. We know that uh, maybe people don't feel uh, comfortable sharing this initially because they don't know your organization, but after they come in and they see that it's a safe place to be, they may feel more comfortable sharing this information later on. Um, and what we have seen too in, um, over the years is that you know, uh, people oftentimes are more reluctant to share their income data um, than they are their sexual orientation and gender identity data. So um, inevitably along the way, you may have some, some challenges uh, with collecting these data. And um, you know, you're gonna have some patients who don't wanna answer the question. Uh, and what we found are that sometimes these patients um, are the same patients who don't really wanna tell you anything about themselves, right? They just, they kinda wanna remain a, remain a mystery. But um, we never wanna force anybody to share this information if they don't want to. Um, there could be many reasons why. Um, you know, I think in the current political environment we're in, um, you know, thinking about the intersectionality of this, there may be uh, populations who are feeling very vulnerable and may not want that information written down or uh, shared on um, their medical record. And so I think it's important to just be very conscious of this. Um, and when somebody doesn't want to answer it, sort of um, maybe understand kind of what's going on there. Um, similarly, um, as Alex said that um, uh, the LGBT Ed Center has gone through some translations and so uh, maybe somebody left something blank because um, the translation wasn't available. Um, and we also know that the words we use in English don't necessarily translate um, culturally as well. So being sort of aware of those issues. Um, you know, sometimes you're gonna be in situations where you have communication problems and um, you know, it's always important to acknowledge that you make a mistake and, and apologize. And one of the things um, I think that is key, and I'll show you an example of what we did at Fenway, is that if you identify a problem and then you apologize, but you don't fix the problem and the person comes in again, you make the same mistake, you apologize, and you sort of have this, you know, repeat uh, situation happen over and over again with a patient, um, you know, what's going to happen? You know, the patient's going to probably get frustrated and may, may never even come back again. Um, so if you identify a problem, the important thing to do is to go about looking into how you might fix, fix that issue. Um, and here's an example of kind of what happened at Fenway. Um, we were having, and we did this probably about, oh gosh, maybe eight years ago, um, 10 years ago. Um, and we were having issues where we were not capturing or using the patient's name and pronoun correctly. And so basically what we did is we, we came up with this graphic where we looked at all the places where patients interacted with other departments. And so what might happen is that the patient would come in and they'd see their medical provider and they'd provide their name and pronouns and all would be fine there and they'd be used correctly. But then let's say they went to our behavioral health department or optometry department, they wouldn't have access to that same information and either the patient would have to share that information again or they would be mispronounced or mis misnamed. And so what we wanted to do is figure out where some of these pain points were um, and then put a process in place um, to fix that. Um, similarly, we also went through a process where we looked in um, within each department um, so that, you know, let's say a nurse practitioner was seeing a patient um, and then the patient was going to have a vaccination. Um, was there some sort of communication gap that was happening between that nurse practitioner and the nurse or the MA um, at the time that that um, uh, immunization was, was being administered? So, so looking for some of those, those opportunities there. Um, and one of the things that came out of it is this color coding system, a color, color block system. And I'll show you in a minute how it looks in our system. Um, but basically, if patients will come in and they be, they'll be able to identify um, what their pronouns were, um, and then we use these color blocks um, as indicators to our staff um, what the correct pronouns were for that patient. Um, and you know, we try to use colors that were contrasted, would kind of stand out a little bit from our EHR um, uh, vendor. Um, we also wanted just ones that were easy for people to remember and sort of have that sort of association for people as well. And so how does this kind of look in our system? Now, I know you all sort of use uh, different EHR, but um, um, but I like in terms of, I like to demonstrate this, at least in terms of the concept, and maybe it's something that you can think about using in your system. Um, many vendors have places where people can upload photos of their patients. Um, we, we have that in our system, but we don't take photos of our patients. So we use this as an opportunity to update and um, um, upload these color blocks into those photos. And, when you look at this, um, 
a screen here, the first thing that pops out at you is that pink color block, right? And so that's, that's really the point of what we're kind of going for here. Um, we really want that to jump out at people initially so that they're not making assumptions and not looking at somebody's name or somebody's gender, making assumptions of what their pronouns are. Um, similarly, we did the same thing in our, um, on our clinical side. So, um, you know, our clinical um, uh, uh, check-in folks see the correct pronoun. Um, and then you don't have to worry about having that communication, like you don't have to worry about your front desk staff communicating with your medical assistants um, or your nurse or your VH person um, in terms of what the pronouns are because it's already in the system. So um, it's not, um, and so when you look at this again, you see that pink color block is the first thing that kind of pops out at you. Um, and this is also really helpful for just that continuity of care for patients so that when um, you know, even if they're working with a provider they've never seen before, you know, that provider immediately sees the pronouns. We've also done um, some issues in our banner where we've uh, adjusted um, uh, the size of the name that the patient uses. So that's the first thing that jumps out as well. Um, I put up this example of a, a pop-up here that has the patient's pronouns. Um, I know many of us are getting pop-up fatigue. Um, and, um, but I like to put up this as an example for people to think about as well, because it may be something that could work in your organization. Um, we also did something too, where we, um, uh, I you know, made up this sort of custom code, we call it THPG, which is, stands for Trans Health Program. Um, and we just put this designation on all of our uh, patients charts who are uh, trans or non-binary. And this just helps with uh, a lot of reporting and again, helps just prompt um, the, the, the staff um, when they sort of see this on the patient summary screen and kind of alerts and alerts them. Um, so again, you know, knowing that we, we all kind of use different um, EHRs, but again, I'd, I'd like to use this just as a way to sort of inspire people and kind of give them ideas of things they could do in their organization. Um, this is just a form that we created for our, our trans health um, 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 intake form. Um, and basically, you know, a lot of clinical people and most clinical people don't really get a lot of training in their in their schooling. And so um, a lot of times people come and come to, you know, us here at Fenway and, you know, don't have a strong background in taking care of trans patients. And so um, we want to provide them with the tools they need to provide good clinical care. And this intake form is just an example of that. It kind of helps walk them through the right questions that they should be asking patients during the process of an intake. And really understanding what the patient's goals are because not all patients want hormones or all patients want therapy and so, or even a, a, a surgery for that matter. And so it's important to understand what their, their ultimate goals are. Um, and similarly, what we did too is we added in a button here that also reminds the providers of what safety labs they need to order. So if they are gonna start um, somebody on um, uh, hormones and they need to make sure that they're ordering the correct safety labs because we don't wanna put have um, something, uh, um, um, a consequence happening with one of the patients. So things that you can think about doing in your system, either within forms or clinical decision support. Um, similarly, um, we did um, an organ inventory uh, where basically a provider will, will check off um, a body part the patient has or doesn't have. Um, and then this information gets added to the patient's problem list. Um, and this is particularly helpful with a billing. So if you need to submit a claim and justify why you're doing a procedure or not doing a procedure for a patient, you already have the, the ICD-10 code right there. Um, or if, again, if you're doing reports looking at patients who are due for certain procedures, so if you're looking at uh, patients who are due for cervical pap smears, you could use this as a way to filter in or filter out people who are appropriately due so you're not sending a letter to somebody um, who basically doesn't have a cervix. Um, so again, just a prep form. Um, we know that um, within certain populations that are very high risk for HIV, um, this is just a great way to um, um, identify people who might be uh, open and, and ready for um, the use of PrEP. So I talked about a number of these examples here, um, things that you can do and think about updating with names and pronouns, um, maybe on patient instructions that we send them, emails, uh, any inter internal labs of that sort. So I know that I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm quickly going to jump into some of the data pieces of this. Um, but certainly, once you have the data, we really want to start doing something with this and really understanding and looking at some of the disparities that might be happening within the patient population. And I'm going to kind of walk you through some examples of this. But the first thing I wanted to do is just kind of just remind people, um, as Alex talked about, everybody has a sexual orientation and a gender identity. 
So when we're doing a data analysis, we don't always want to lump all LGBTQ people in the denominator, right? So we might be looking at um, maybe a measure that's gender only gender-based, so we don't necessarily want to include people sexual orientation in that matter, right, or vice versa. So kind of understanding what it is that you're looking at. Similarly, um, if you under, want to understand who your trans or non-binary patients are, um, it's really important to look at both sex assigned at birth um, and gender identity because um, just looking at one of them alone, you may potentially miss a patient, patient population. And I'm just going to kind of show you an example of what I mean by that. So this is a two-step question that's, that's um, widely recommended. So in this case, let's say we just look at the patient's current gender identity. You may have a patient comes in and says that they're a trans man. And so obviously in that case, it's kind of easy to, easy to sort of see who that person is in the data. But as Alex said, you know, not everybody identifies that way. So you may have a patient who comes in and they check the box that they're male. So now um, we're gonna make some assumptions about that person and potentiate body parts that they have or don't have as a result of that. But when we bring in the sex assigned at birth question and we look at the patient's response on that, we see that the patient is female. So this gives us more information um, on, 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 um, about the patient and, and, and ways to potentially proceed in terms of um, the procedures that they might be due for. Um, this is just, you know, in terms of understanding your uh, data and your missingness sometimes. Um, you know, how are you doing in collecting these data compared to some of your other uh, sociodemographic variables? Um, this is just one way to look at it. And if you see that, you know, the percentages are off, um, it gives you opportunity to sort of dive into that and say, like, where are the problems? Is it a particular clinic? Is it a particular day of the clinic? Is it a particular staff person? Kind of what's going on with some of the data collection in there? Also, similarly, um, understanding where some of the gaps and differences are in terms of the, the, the data and the missingness, um, you can really, uh, you know, cro cross and stratify this by all sorts of um, variables, social determinants of health, country of birth, um, as I did here. Um, and when you look at that and you look at the aggregate data, you could see that the missingness looks pretty similar in terms of those who are born in the U.S. versus those who are born outside the U.S. But when we look at the data proportionally, what we do see is that there are actually pretty big differences in this example, right? So we see that the rates of missingness are pretty are much higher um, for those who are born outside the U.S. And again, just giving you some more information about like what what's kind of going on there that um, we're seeing we're seeing differences there. Um, similarly, you know, many of the vendors also try to do a really great job of creating these custom reports for us. But unfortunately, what happens in a lot of times is that they, they create these reports and they sort of make assumptions based on that sex field, right, in the chart, which we all know is basically based on the person's um, information that's listed with their insurer and not necessarily doesn't tell you much about the, their body part. So, um, so in this example, the first row there, Donald Test, um, we see that is listed as a male, um, 45. So we're assuming that because Donald's a male, Donald doesn't need a cervical pap screening or breast cancer screening. But when we actually bring in information around gender identity, um, we actually see a very different story. We see that um, Donald is actually a trans man. Um, and in this case, we don't necessarily know um, uh, Donald's anatomy, but what it does is it sort of raises that question, right? It sort of raises that question that, okay, I should go into this person's chart and see whether or not I need to have this person come in for a pap smear. Um, and as Alex um, provided in one of the examples, case studies earlier, um, we know that even if people have um, breast surgery, that they could still have some breast residual tissue, and that it's very important for them to still um, have screening. And so in this case, um, Donald would still need to have that screening. And so, and so by bringing in the additional data, um, we just, it helps us at really um, addressing a lot of those disparities that we're seeing in the LGBTQ patient population, because um, they're basically invisible and being missed because the data is not um, accurate. Um, this is just another example of, you know, now that you have the data, what can you begin to do with it? Um, you know, a way that you can, again, look at, are you seeing differences in screening rates with your lesbian patients, the bisexual patients compared to your straight patients? Um, if you are seeing them, you know, what can you do? Can you get a focus group together and kind of understand what some of those barriers might be about? Um, similarly, um, we know that there's, um, we're seeing uh, rates of HIV in infection are very different among um, some of the populations. And so again, how are we doing at screening our um, Latino, Latina X population? And subsequently, if people are positive, getting them connected up into care. 
Um, for those of you that are um, health centers, even those of you who need to deal with pay for performance measures, um, again, you know, another way for you to think about looking at your data and seeing how well you're doing compared to uh, your straight or cis population. Um, you know, this example, you know, we're looking at mammograms stratified by each of the, um, you know, LGB and T and, and then Q categories. Um, so again, are you seeing differences? Um, is there, what's going on with that? Are people just not being picked up in reports? Um, are patients not wanting to come in or are they afraid to come in? Do they not want the procedure done? Um, if they had traumatic experiences previously um, with some of these procedures. So, um, you know, understanding kind of what some of those barriers might be for people. Um, and similarly, you know, we know that, um, uh, you know, uh, in some LGBTQ patients um, also have higher rates of tobacco use. So again, um, how well are you doing at sort of screening people subsequently getting them connected up to uh, cessation services? Um, so just lastly, I'll just finish up and sort of remind people that, you know, once we start rolling this out, it's always kind of keeping the ball rolling. So thinking about ways in which you can really incorporate, incorporate these data uh, into your everyday work. And so a lot of times we just don't have time for another work group, but you know, if you already have initiatives going on that are maybe looking at heart disease or diabetes, uh, you know, can you, can you incorporate and stratify these data by LGBTQ patients? And you know, are, how are their A1Cs doing, again, compared to their counterparts? So, um, so really sort of, and I think that it also helps um, resonate with staff too, uh, when you sort of give them, when we have these sort of real life examples too. Um, and oftentimes we do a real great job of ramping up and training staff, but you know, think of ways in which you, know, you can sort of do the training on an ongoing basis. Uh, many of us have to do annual trainings as part of certification process. So can you incorporate some of this LGBTQ training into that? Um, also thinking about, if you're anything like us, you know, we do have staff turnover. Uh, so, you know, can you incorporate some of this training into, into your new staff orientation so that from a patient perspective, you know, they have a very same experience, whether it's somebody who's been here for five years or, you know, five, five months for that matter. So with that, I'll, I'll end and see if anybody has any questions.